Welcome to Tanak Talk. I'm your host, William Hall, broadcasting live out of Kingsland, Texas, USA, with another episode of Debunking the Missionaries. Tonight, part 27, or episode 27, part 5, the early Christianity, the summary of the historical Jesus with Reverend Moshe Schulman. Everybody, welcome back. So glad you're here. Hello. Yes, sir. Can you hear me good? All right. Yeah, I could hear you. I can hear how, how bad you sound also. Oh, so. not for long, hopefully. <laughs> I'm sure more like so. Yeah, no, these things pass. Yes, sir. I, mean, I realize you're having a, a cold wave down where you are, so. You yeah, well, we got that Arctic blast, um, believe it or not, came in. Um, put us way down, whoa, way down in the 70s, man. Oof. Um, you know, that's, that's, you got to put on your uh, fireplace and heat it up. I mean, that's a positive 70. Oof, man. <laughs> that's funny, right? No, it, it is interesting though, because during during the summertime when it's like in the in the triple digits, they'll say a cool front coming in. That just means you might break the triple digits and get into ninety nine. That's all it means. So that's all right though. If there were a, if there were a geographical hell, um, Texas would probably be pretty close to it <laughs> in the sense of temperature goes. I don't know. I'm just kidding. Well, very good, Rabbi. Well, glad we glad we got her going, and um, uh, we'll let you kick off with uh, with. This is the historical Jesus part five on the summary. So, well, actually, I'm going to be covering a little bit about early Christianity here. Okay. Um, we dealt with a lot of issues about historical Jesus outside of the New Testament. Okay. So, one of the key questions that comes up is we know in the beginning the early followers of Jesus were Jewish. We know in the second century and further. Basically, the church was Gentile. Mm. How did we get from here to there? Okay, it's okay. a question. Right. There's some information we do have, and there's a lot of information we don't. So what I'd like to do is go over a little stuff of the history that we had so far. Okay. Um, and give what I think is based on some of the information in the New Testament and, and information outside of it, an idea as to when actually the Jewish and Christian, Jewish Christians and the Christian, the Gentile Christians split, and then we could see how that develops later on. Uh, the Christianity we have today is actually comes from Gentile Christianity. Uh, the church was totally Gentile. It was a church that everything based on the church that uh, decide on which books are going to be in the Bible, that we talked about earlier. This was a Gentile church. It was not a Jewish church. They had no Jewish input whatsoever. Any time, even when there was somebody converted. And there were some converts, of course, that were there. Um, they totally abandoned Judaism, and they considered themselves Gentiles, much in the same way that, for example, when somebody became a uh, pagan, um, he had abandoned all his Judaism. So what I'd like to do is just let's look a little bit about what we have here until now, how much we know from non-Christian sources about Jesus. And as, as we found until now, the truth of the matter is we don't really have very much. Outside of the New Testament, um, we don't have anything in the first century that gives us any information whatsoever that we can rely upon outside of the books of the New Testament and Paul's letters, which were written in the first century. Other than that, we really don't have the closest to first century, of course, is Josephus, written at the very end of the first century. And as we did last week, we went through the passage, and from that we basically have the best, I mean, my view, of course, is that in fact there was nothing there. The best you could say about it is that maybe Josephus did hear about someone named Jesus and had a little information, but that was definitely not first hand information, nor did it seem to be very important information. Now, besides that, there's another piece of information which I didn't mention to you. There's a book by Lauren Schiffman, Professor Lauren Schiffman, um, called Who Was a Jew, which discusses the issue of the Jewish Christians when they separated from. The actual Jewish community. It's well known that, in fact, the Jewish Christians were still praying in Jewish communities. Uh, we see a little bit of that in the book of Acts in the beginning, where they would still go to the temple, they would still be involved in the synagogue, um, and that continued until the Bar Kokhba revolt, which was uh, 135, about um, putting it in the early second century. And the reason for the split was Bar Kokhba declared himself to be the Messiah, the, the Jewish Christians couldn't go with that. So they abandoned that, and that brought the, the wrath of the Jewish people against them. There basically was a split over that, and they went their own way. Um, there were these Jewish Christian groups that existed until a bit later, but they basically all were stamped out by the church. So we know 
there was a certain trajectory of Jewish Christianity that existed within the Jewish people, um, or not within the Jewish people, but at least among the Jewish community had some kind of interaction with them. Um, and, 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 you know, existed for another hundred years or so. And then they basically disappeared. Some did exist in certain places, but it was basically like a totally non-existence until they disappeared, I believe, by the fifth century. There were no more, no more groups that considered themselves distinctively Jewish. Um, we mentioned Ebionites earlier was or one of those that lasted until then. So that's what we see about there from the, that side of it. Otherwise, what do we see? We don't really see very much. We have some Jewish, we have some uh, um, Roman historians, uh, Suetonius and Tacitus, who make mention of things that have to do with Christians or appear to have things to do with Christians, but we don't really get any information that could be said to be f firsthand. And this, again, is in the early part of the second century, where by then we know that Christianity has spread to different areas. And it's there's certainly the Gentile Christianity was beginning to form itself into a, um, a religious type of an organization. So we have Suetonius and Tacitus both write about Nero, and Suetonius writes about um, the time of Claudius. And so we see from that very, very little information that we can get about Jesus, except maybe somebody that was believed to be Jesus. Not quite sure about the, uh, the time in Claudius, although most scholars appear to think that the crest is there refers to Jesus. Um, Tacitus mentions, and, and both mention these, that under Nero, actual Christians were persecuted. And then we have with Pliny the Younger, who lived also about the same time, his letters to Trajan. Gives us a little bit more information about Christianity, um, that by this time the uh, Christians actually considered Jesus to be godlike. But other than that, we don't really have any information of any sort from, from that time. The other source that sometimes people look to is, of course, the Talmud, the rabbis in the Talmud. And again, as we pointed out, there are two main um, two main themes, two main characters that are considered possibilities. One is someone called Yisho Hanotri that we see from um, Tractate Sanhedrin, Tractate Sota. But the problem with that, of course, is that um, the dating of it in the time of Rabbi Yehoshua ben Parachia, will date this into the early first century BCE at the latest, not much more than that, which means that um, it's basically well over 100 years off. The second one is ben Pandura, which also seems to be uh, a, a very popular. One of the reasons why, of course, it was, as I mentioned, is that many of the attacks on uh, the Christians as Celsus brings is that he was actually the uh, a, a bastard son of somebody in Pantera. Um Again, the sources for this become problematic because they're placed within historical information. And all of these place it clearly after the destruction of the first temple. And according to Toysus in Shabbos 104, that places him actually in the time of Rabbi Kiva, which would again be 120s, 135 is when Rabbi Kiva died. He was a martyr during the Bar Kokhba revolt. So it takes them to that time. So again, as I mentioned before, the Talmud, the Talmud doesn't give us much information. Basically what we have is a few different views. If we say that the, uh, and there were rabbis who of course said that the person in Sanhedrin, Yishar and Nazi was actually real Jesus. But then the problem being is that we would have to date him a hundred or so years before uh, Christians date him. And then there are others who say there's two and some would say that the, the Talmud has nothing to do with it, which is, it seems to be um, uh, more likely from some ways. But then again, I proposed another possibility, which again, I'm not saying that 100% certain that it would be true, but there is certainly a possibility that um, the stories of these two people were mixed together since we're talking about oral traditions. And in oral traditions, we see it, and see especially by Hasidim with oral traditions, we can find it where the name of the actual subject of the story sometimes gets changed. One other point that I pointed out that um, we saw until now is that, interestingly enough, there is, when we refer to the Talmud, there seems to be a distinction, a disagreement. Um, one, of, one of very interesting is that the scholars, 
the more scholarly works, Bart Ehrman, um, um, Peter Schaefer, they uh, just discount anything in the Talmud of having any historic, historical value to it as far as first-hand information. They consider in some ways less than even the Roman, Roman records. Whereas the Christian scholars try to bring it in as some kind of historical uh, support for different information about the life of Jesus. So, for example, because it's mentioned that the person in Sanhedrin was was executed the day before Passover, in a very interesting story there, um, you find people like Hebrew Mas Bruce, you know, pointing to that and mm -hmm. saying that, you know, that indicates that maybe uh, it's a support of the book of John rather than saying that at best maybe it's just the reaction to the book of John just saying some things about that. Although there are, again, a few Christian scholars will come out and say, no, there's no way to put it. So that's all we have on this subject. <clears throat> we don't really have very much more. Um, again, as I say, my view on the, the rabbinic writings is a pretty simple one, and that is that I hold that uh, is a good chance that actually stories were mixed together, because oral tradition does that, and uh, the histories that were done about Jesus, well, what they refer to as these Greek bios, which um, the information they give is basically um, legendary material taken together and things of that nature. And that kind of material is very, very easy to, things to seep in that aren't real. Again, bottom line is, is that all speculation aside, outside of the New Testament, we don't have really any significant information about Jesus, whatever information we have outside at that time, where we could have come from, the Christians themselves. So as a, just as a brief um, closing statement for today's show, not necessarily... Oh, I've, got, I've got stuff to go, that's okay. Not, not, not like, uh, not that we're going to sum up every show you've done in 27 episodes, but um, the only thing that I've heard so far that has any, uh, any textural... A textual um, appearance of there being a Jesus figure was in uh, the complete works of Josephus, and it was only a small excerpt that didn't seem to fit, yeah. like it was, like it was inserted yeah. right by someone else, like a yeah, forgery. And, yeah, that one is one that's the most controversial, and even um, I mean, there are a few people who think the whole thing is is legitimate, but that's one that you you can't really. It's very hard to find somebody who you would consider a serious scholar, evangelical or otherwise who accepts that, uh, you know, it wasn't tampered. So we know the text, the text was tampered. That That's like, you know, scholars 80%, 90%, you know. Right. You can exclude the people like KJV, only type of people who wouldn't agree with such things. When we're talking about people who seriously try to look into it, and now, uh, you won't find anybody who, who thinks that... Um, and that text is, is legitimate. And regarding the, the name... It's all, the some name. parts, they would... Like what says it's the Messiah and whatever right. you got people. So things that would be, by the end of the first century, would be done by you know anybody writing a history who, who, about them would be much of a thing. So regarding the the name used, Jesus or Yeshua or Yehoshua in the Talmud, um, the majority leans to say that that's not the same Jesus, right? Yeah, well, it's like this. Um, the majority of rabbis believe that it's Jesus. He just lived a hundred and something years earlier than the Christians say. Mm, gotcha, gotcha. The majority of things would say that. Um, there's no doubt about the people that are talked about are actually legitimate, real people. Okay, that's I'm where I was leading. Out, yeah. Okay. I pointed out to you um, discussing a story in Josephus that appears in the Talmud many, many generations later uh, about how the uh, the king, Hashemun and Kim, became a Sadducee. And the information between the two is virtually identical. Hmm, um, interesting. It's a kind of, so we see that, in fact, many of the stories, at least about that time, uh, would certainly are, are verifiable and seem to be, have some kind of validity to it, some kind of truth to it. But again, the bottom line with that stuff is, um, as far as Jesus himself, it doesn't appear to, to give us very much information on that. However, there's another thing. That's a question I started broaching a little bit earlier before I got sidetracked back again with this stuff. And that is, we know that the original Christians were Jewish. Um, so how is it that, in fact, the Christianity in the second century and on was basically a Gentile Christianity? Gentiles chose out everything. Gent Jews had like almost, uh, almost no 
no interaction. In fact, those sex, those groups, like the Ebionites, mm-hmm. Nazarenes that were Jewish in the sense that they continued to follow the commandments um, and felt that it was necessity as opposed to the Christian Gentile Christians. How was it that uh, the split took place? Mm-hmm. Took, about, took place, and about when would it happen? And I think that um, the again this. The, when it comes to ancient history and stuff like that, we can only suppose or, you know, make a proposal and see if there's any information that disagrees with it. But I think there's a very good case to be made this way, is that if we examine what little information we do have about Christianity um, outside of the New Testament, we find something very interesting. And I did point this out before. Pliny the Younger, in his letters to Trajan, writes about Christians that he finds in his, his communities um, who wouldn't worship the uh, emperor. Now, what I pointed out earlier, and it's a point that has to be taken in mind, what this tells us is, in fact, these people were Gentile Christians, and that Christianity in those areas was totally divorced from Judaism. The reason being, if they were Jewish, they would already be um, allowed not to make sacrifice to the emperor Mm. because the Jewish people uh, enjoyed that privilege other than other, you know, other people because while other nations were polytheistic, so if you already worship 50 gods, what's the difference if you had one, 51 instead of 50? So when the Romans took over different places, they required you to worship their their, um, emperors also. Which, if you understand polytheism, it's really not a problem. I mean, they believe that there's powers, and so the emperor seems to be a powerful guy, so why not offer not sacrifice to him also? No big deal. But Judaism was monotheistic, which the Romans and the Greeks abhorred. They thought it was, they referred to it many times as a superstition or atheist. They considered them atheists because they didn't believe in all the gods. Right, right. You don't believe in God, you're an atheist. Um, so, uh, but because of the ancient nature of Judaism, that Judaism was old, they didn't bother it. I, as I brought before, the uh, my favorite uh, parable of that is you have to basically consider polytheism. Look at it pretty much like the mafia. Uh, the belief in the people was that the gods control things, and basically you had to pay them off with sacrifice. And you paid them off with sacrifice is okay, but it required everybody to be part of this system to pay them off because if somebody didn't, then they would lose the favor of the gods and bad things would happen. However, since the Jewish people and the Jewish religion was old, and they lived in that area, and they didn't seem to have to um, give any sacrifices to all these gods, it appeared the gods were okay with it. Maybe the god was powerful enough, whatever, but it was okay with it. So we see that Jewish people didn't have to make the sacrifice. Now, when Pliny was having his trials, and we see that he was trying to be extremely fair about it within the law, the law then was that you had to sacrifice because it was necessary for, for the, the, the well-being of the state. It was, it, was a, it was basically treasonous not to sacrifice. So if they had been Jewish or they considered themselves part of Judaism, part of a Jewish sect, then they would obviously be able to say, very simply, as any other Jew would say, I'm Jewish, I'm monotheist. We have protection from the Roman state. The Roman state decreed that we don't have to do it. The Roman state was very superstitious, very careful. They didn't, they didn't, you know, they didn't want to get on the bad side of anybody's gods. So they were careful about some things like that. You know, right. they were very... They were very liberal when it came to such things. So they wouldn't have bothered the Jews about it. So if these Christians who were got there were Gentiles who did not think themselves being Jewish at all, then they would be in problem. But if they thought themselves as Jewish, they only had to say that we were, we were a Jewish sect and they would have gotten out of it. What this tells us then is by the beginning of the first century, clearly Gentile Christianity was separated, was divorced from the early Jewish Christianity. They were totally separate. The question is, when did the separation happen? Now, we, again, as I pointed out earlier, there was a Jewish Christianity which did exist um, somewhat related to the Jewish people until the, the revolt against Hadrian. After that sort of split, and there were some groups that existed, but uh, they were, of course, small and they disappeared. They had nothing to do with the main type of Christianity, which was Gentile Christianity, which chose out the, the, the canon, 
those Jewish groups that were Jewish Christians, they called them. They had their own canon, they had their own scriptures. They were totally different. They, they were totally separated. So the Christianity we have today is actually an, a descendant from that Gentile Christianity. So the question is, when did it start? We know it was clearly there by the beginning of the second century. Okay? Um, there are a number of things that we see there also because of Marcion. Marcion came out with uh, a total rejection of the Old Testament. Something in the second century became very popular with Christianity. Even until today, we do see this sort of rejection of the Old Testament when you will hear preachers talk about how the God in the Old Testament was a angry God, but the God of the New Testament is a loving God. This all goes back to um, the early first second century where Marcion and many Christians at that time rejected the God of the New Te Old Testament as being an angry God as opposed to Jesus being a God of love. So we see in the, se in the first century, we, by second century, we see that until eventually the Gentile church by the end of the second century, um, we have uh, Melito of Sardis as being the first person that we know of accusing the Jewish people of uh, deicide. That happened around 167 CE. So we see that from the time of Pliny and further, we see that the church is not only Gentile, but it's clearly moving in a, ne a direction against Judaism, seeing Judaism not a a as like an evil thing against it. Okay? Yep. So again, we, we see where did the separation happen? We know when there is. There's a Jewish Christianity and that and a Christian and a Gentile Christianity by the first cent in the first century. And the Gentile Christianity is already stronger and it, it, it totally takes over everything within the first cent second century. Um, no influence for the, from Jewish Christianity in the second century. Well, we know from the beginning of Acts, of course, that the early Christians were Jewish and they you know, went out and they went out to, to, to support. Now let's go back to the Roman histories, histories. Nero in 64, he talks about, he persecutes the Christians in Rome as a separate group from the Jews. The Christians in Rome were persecuted because they did not worship the, 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 the Roman gods, something the Jews didn't have to. But Nero, we have this from Tacitus versus Tertullus, um, pretty much one of the best examples of a historical record, of historical, one of the first actual instances that we know of, of a real persecution of Christians as Christians, um, was Nero. And uh, to the point that some scholars say that 666 is the... Um, uh, value of Nero in uh, uh, Greek or Roman, so I think Roman, and because of that, they think that the 666 in, in Revelation is actually referring to him. Uh, That's a different story. I'm not going to, you know, I don't. Right. It's not as interesting, you know, so like, what is it saying, Lord of the Rings? It's, you know, Revelation, Lord of the Rings, about the same thing as far as I'm concerned. Right. Yeah. So we know by Nero's time, which is now 64 CE about 40-something, 40, 50 years earlier than, 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 Tat, than um, Pliny, Christians, Gentile Christians, were separate from Jews. As a distinguished, we could separate, we can distinguish these Christians, that they're actually Gentiles, they're not Jewish. Okay? Right. So there we So let's go back. 30s, late 30s, 40s, something like that, the Christian church was Christian, Jewish. Right? They're just beginning to send out for, 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 for Gentiles, so it's a Jewish organization into the 40s. Okay? By 64, we know that the church is separate from the Jewish people. Even the Jewish Christians that still become part of the Jews are actually separated from the Christians. They're, 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 they're basically enemies, they're hated. So that's 64, that's getting us closer and closer. So before, what goes on around between then? We have the first Jerusalem Council in the book of Acts, which is somewhere around 50, give or take a little bit. So what does that decide? That decided something very simple. It decided that, number one, Gentiles did not have to convert to Judaism. So the church itself, though it might have considered itself one church, actually split itself. Those who were born Jewish were required to keep 
the commandments to keep a Jewish life. And those who were Gentile didn't have to. They had to make sure they didn't eat from idols and stuff like that, things that are similar to our Noahide laws. Some people think actually that's what they said in Noahide laws. But we see the Jerusalem Council. The Jerusalem Council actually decided that there's actually two flavors of Christianity. There's a Jewish Christianity where they're required to keep the commandments, which we know that James and his people did keep it. And we find that there are other groups, Ebionites, which kept it later, which many scholars believe is actually the descendants of um, James's Jerusalem church, which was Jewish and mitzvah observant, which is a view that I believe is much more logical than to say that there were Gentiles who decided to go back to Judaism. It's, it's, it's much less logical to say that than to otherwise, considering the situation. And then there was a Gentile church, which primarily followed the teachings of Paul. Paul was the main teacher in the Gentile church because he was the main evangelist. Now, if that's correct, then a lot of things seem to make more sense. We can understand even modern day Christianity. The church split around 50. The Gentile church, the Jewish church, um, the book of James, remember Luther did not like the book of James because he called it a gospel of straw. It was too Jewish for him. It seemed very much, it was very much in works, a very much Jewish type of thing that you would expect, something that maybe the Jewish Christians followed. That was in the New Testament, but again, it represented that part of Christianity which was Jewish and stayed Jewish and sort of eventually disappeared, but didn't have any real, except for that book, it didn't really have any serious influence into Christianity. And the book of James is probably one of the least read books of all. But Paul's letters are actually fundamentally the theological underpinning Christianity. Um, when we look in the second century, Mark, for example, his whole basis of everything is, is from Paul. Um, even today, if you get into a discussion about people about Christianity, they will say, they will draw from the books of Paul, you don't see people drawing from the books of James very much. So we see, I think it, it, it's a pretty logical and it pretty much fits out that sometime after the first Jerusalem Council in Acts 50, the split started and it started getting more and more after that. So we can see that Christianity sort of splits out. It leads to that. And then we get again into, we can look back again and we talked about the canon. Why was the canon that way? Because again, it's flowing through a Gentile church. The Gentile church, um, you know, had, you know, was non-Jewish. And in many ways it got even worse. As as if we look at some of the later written gospels that we they're called apocryphal gospels, gospels but written later, written later, and even with some that had influence, like the epistle of uh, Barnabas had influence later, was very anti-Jewish and was uh, totally non literal about any of the commandments of the, in the Torah. So we have to be very familiar with Christianity today, where they, they refer to the commandments of the Torah not as being actual things to do, but they're, they're, they're sort of like, you know, uh, they're like really hinting at the deeper Indians, deeper ideas. This all comes from the second century where the Gentile church totally rejected Judaism. We can see that the canon developed that way from people who are outside the church. So again, the way uh, to, to, to summarize what I was thinking about this issue is basically, I think that we can see uh, what we see is trajectories of how things develop and Christianity splits. There's a Jewish group that stays somewhat Jewish until the uh, middle of the early part of the second century after Bar Kokhba. And they, they just, you know, get smaller and smaller, uh, Ebionites and Nazarenes and stuff like that, until they t totally disappear, having actually, you know, no numbers. They disappear, become a Christian, whatever. And the rest is a Gentile church, which following Paul's teachings is a basis. And, and going on from there, that becomes a real church, makes the canon. Uh, the Catholic church becomes from part of it. All this organizational structure which comes about, all of that stuff comes from the Gentile side of the church. That's why the church was so gentilized and so, so that's why eventually, for example, moves, moves sh the Sabbath, the Shabbat was moved from Saturday to Sunday. They, they did the same thing with the Easter. They didn't want to have Easter at the same time as the Jewish people had it. They wanted the total separation, again, was starting from the, the first Jerusalem Council until it reaches the trajectory, until eventually the Christianity is totally separated from its Jewish roots. So it happened completely. Now, 
in in that vein, it's it's very interesting to just make a comment about the uh, messianics today, because their claim is, of course, that they want to go back to the early church that it was in the Book of Acts. But again, that's not what they're doing, because in the Book of Acts, um, that was before the Pauline letters. Uh, mitzvah observant was considered key to your life. You had to do it. The, some of the ideas from, from Paul were not as, as well known being saved because of uh, Jesus' death as opposed to uh, following God's will. James's is, is epistle is a good idea, a good place to look, where it talks about how being saved from works, which again would very much fit with the Jewish thing. Jewish thing. So the Messianic movement has a lot of problems in, in its idea of trying to rebuild something that you know you can't turn the clock back. Right. Besides the fact that they like to follow a lot of rabbinic laws that come later on, they have no idea what would have been, what what they would have you know kept at that time would have been different at that time. Many of the customs we have were totally different from what they had at that time. Okay, so let's just sum up. I see you 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 feel so bad. I just trying to rush through some of this stuff so I can get you off. Oh yeah. You right down. Right down. I appreciate uh, that. Thanks. Um, I mean, if there are questions, I'll take them up next week. You know, if we have since if I went up too fast over some things. Okay. But I think this stuff is pretty simple. Most of the people who know the New Testament, so you can pretty much see what I was talking about there. So essentially, like this: outside of the New Testament, basically we have almost no information. We have no first-hand information, and even the information we have, which is second-hand, was heard from Christians. So we don't really have. A clear idea of anything from that. Again, in the beginning, I mentioned that we do. There are things that scholars, and I think some of these things I would agree with from the logic, is that um, it, there probably was a Jesus who lived in the first century. Okay. There's a lot of support for that. Um, that he was executed by the Romans is the support for that. Also, the belief in that. But once we start going beyond that, we start getting into some shaky ground. And some of this I'm going to start covering in some of the next lectures we're going to have. Okay. Now, what I want to do next week, and I'll, I'm just going to give you a floor plan of what's going on from now. Next week, what I want to do is I'm going to do uh, 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 one one or two weeks. I'm not sure, sure how long it's going to take me. On the real New Testament Jesus, what we're going to do is this. Um, we're going to look at the New Testament, what it really says about Jesus, and evaluate what we think about him. And we're going to compare him with uh, many of the famous rabbis of the um, Talmud, um, how they were, and compare with Jesus and say, and see, you know, was Jesus really such a phenomenal Jew as some people like to complain, uh, say he is? After that, we're going to deal with some general issues. We're going to go back to the New Testament critically again. Okay. And we're going to look at the New Testament and look at it is it something that's historically accurate? Now, we know the Conant refers to the New Testament as Christian bios, so there's going to be legendary material and stuff like that. What we want to do is we want to look at and see, um, given that, how really accurate is it? How much we can trust on some of things in there? And after discussing a number of issues, we're going to go to the main one, which is the resurrection. Can we really do, can we rely and or trust that the resurrection actually occurred? Excuse me. And in analyzing the resurrection, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use, I guess, the most modern um, apologetic method that, that we see from Christians, and that's called the minimal fact uh, argument, where they chose out, choose out those facts that they can consider accepted by the overbody or the overall majority of them, and string that together and say, with that, the most logical explanation is going to be the resurrection. We'll see, we'll discuss that, and we'll discuss as to why that fails. Okay. And Sounds that will end up um, my discussion on the historical Jesus, in which case we will start moving on to the next thing, which is I want to talk about, um, before I can get to Dr. Brown's book, which is going to talk about why he thinks Jesus is the Messiah, the whole, next we're going to talk about what the real Messiah is. We're going to have to discuss a lot of stuff with that. But that will come after that. And that's basically it. I mean, okay. I could talk more for a while, but I see you feel right. horrible. Just do me one thing. Just take a quick look and see if there's any questions I can answer. Okay. I don't have my YouTube channel pulled up. Let me see if I can find that. Hang on. Yeah. If there's any questions that can be answered, that's fine. It's a little bit shorter than I would like oh. to do, but, you know. Yeah. 
Actually, I, if, if I you don't mind, we, let, let's check it in the, in the follow-up chat, if, if you don't mind, for maybe next week. Um, okay. If you no, mind, so. no problem, Ned, because I yeah. see you're not feeling well, and I'm not going to. Yeah, gonna... please. Okay. That'll work. I'm not going to go into things. I mean, most of these things we did cover any before. Yeah. I just wanted to clear up some. Right. Loose right. ends and uh, do that, and then next week we could start on a new thing, which is going to okay. be around the phone. Sure. That sounds like a good plan. All right. Well, thank you all for tuning in. Thank you, Rabbi, for your time. And we'll see you guys um, for a full schedule tomorrow. I'll say for about three or four shows tomorrow, too. So I look forward to seeing you guys in. Uh, Rabbi, have a great week. And take care, everybody. Thanks.